You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 189, live Q&A from Boston. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser, with David Burnett, who's also... He's a scholar. <laughs> so we want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's a second live Q&A show, and we have a good turnout, another good turnout. So yeah, that means good. lots of questions from y'all. So I'm sure everybody has good <laughs> questions, right? Okay. Questions about my dog are acceptable. Okay. <laughs> well, we want to briefly go around the room and introduce people, starting with yes. Brad. Hey, I'm Brad. I'm from Plainfield, Massachusetts. Um, I guess, why, why a pug? Why a pug? Because pugs are awesome. No, I, I've, I've wanted a pug for years. Yeah? Yeah, and it was finally my turn to pick the dog. So, All right. you know, I got my way. All right. How could it be Sean? <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm, I'm a Bichon fan, but... That's so right. you, you you kind of understand. You just get attached to. The, there you go. I always thought it was because the UFO stuff and Men in Black. No, 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 no. Well, <laughs> that that did play a part. <laughs> yep. Yep. Where are you from? I, I'm Dan. I'm from Westminster, Massachusetts. Uh, my question this evening: um, being raised in a pseudo Christian system. Um, I was always taught soul sleep, and the proof text was always Ecclesiastes 9. Um, when I'm witnessing to family members, how do I, what's the best route to refute that? Mm-hmm. Let, let's finish going around, and then we'll start with that. I'm Ed. I'm from Lunenburg, Mass. Hi, I'm Mike. This is Nicole, my wife, and we're from Brockton, Massachusetts. I'm Mike, too. I'm Mike Chu. Um, I'm from Quincy, Massachusetts. I'm Ken from Walden, Massachusetts. April from Walden, Massachusetts. Trey from New Orleans, Louisiana. How did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm Brittany from Falmouth, Massachusetts. It is. Okay. I'm Michelle, and I'm from Falmouth, Massachusetts. Right. I'm Rita, and I live in Boston, Mattapan. I'm Allie from New Bedford, Massachusetts. All right, so the the soul sleep question. Well, I'll I'll answer that this way. Here's why it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. A couple of quick reasons. You have um, you have scenes in scripture where you have these post death or post or you know, sort of resurrective appearances where you have people that were from the Old Testament era that are deceased and yet they have conversations. Okay, there are things like that. That happened. You have First Samuel twenty eight thirteen. Uh, again, I guess I suppose someone could say, "Well, they woke you know Samuel up, you know, so they could have the conversation." But uh, again, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because scenes like that are, you know, really frequent in ancient Near Eastern material that are again sort of not models, but but very close parallels to those sorts of things, and you don't have a soul sleep situation there. Another issue would be this whole idea of I'm going to go go meet my fathers or I'm going to be, you know, buried with my fathers. And, and on the surface, that might not sound like much of anything, but archaeologically speaking, when, you know, Israelite, you know, graves, just like most other graves are discovered, you'll have grave goods, things that the uh, the people burying the deceased person, you know, expects, anticipates, imagines. The, that person will use in the afterlife. Again, this is very common in, in Israelite burials. So if this is what they believe that, you know, you, you die and then you're asleep and you don't really have, you know, any sort of, you know, conscious existence or however we want, we want to describe that uh, on the other side, why would they do that? Again, if that was their expectation that it's just a long nap, it doesn't, the, the practice and funerary practices in general uh, don't make a whole lot of sense. So they're, these are just threads that I think um, sort of conjoin uh, in the whole idea. But it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You have the, you know, David, I don't know if you've ever studied this, but just the, the terminology, the sleep terminology, again, is going to be pretty common for your, your dead. It doesn't necessarily have to mean you're, 
again, in some, you know, sleep situation. Um, so I, I, again, you got three or four things just off the top of my head that don't seem to be terribly consistent, you know, with the idea. Want to add anything to that? Well, Ecclesiastes 9 is saying, so the living know they'll die, but the dead know nothing. Can you clarify what it is that yeah, I, I, trying to I, say? I think, I think the comparison there, again, the, the way I've, I've seen it taken, this isn't unique to me, is that the dead know nothing with respect to, again, sort of the experience of, of the living. In other words, the, the things that you would know in, in, in your embodied life are now, you know, sort of cut off from the dead because they're dead. You know, just, just sort of that thing. Now, that doesn't mean that the dead, because, you, again, you have passages to the effect that the dead or, again, resurrected or glorified beings, although maybe you'd want to say something about this, David, a lot of the, the idea that, that we're being watched really refers to angelic activity. You know, we did that episode on, on the, you know, the books of heaven and stuff like that. So I don't know that that necessarily refers to the, the deceased, but you, you, don't, you don't really get the impression that they have a, you know, again, that they have the sort of knowledge that, uh, of, of the embodied life that they did before. In other words, that they just know everything and can track with everything. So again, that's not unique to me. There are others who take it that way because of some of this other stuff. Oh, I was the only thing I'd probably add to that is in my view, in my take on it, um, is there's not, well, this is a sort of a common trope in scholarship that, that there's not a monolithic sort of view of afterlife mm-hmm. in the Bible. Yeah, so there's a divergence, especially in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, there's no sort of developed afterlife theology that you see coming out in the new Testament, uh, in in that way so it's not manifest in that way in the old testament i mean the best you can get is daniel i mean and you you could argue for the language of rising from dust in isaiah 24 the dry bones in ezekiel 37 or something but but those are being interpreted later as a literal sort of astralization so you can uh, you just what you just said reminded me of something else that here's here's the kind of thing that how much how much can you draw from it okay the shades are going to meet you when you like Isaiah fourteen. Okay, so so in other words, the 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 shades, the Rephaim are going to meet you. What are they going to do? You know, look over your bed and say he's asleep. You know, or are they going to wake you up? They're going to poke you. You know, the the idea that there's this meeting, and again, there's there's again some sort of um, what's being said is that well, you ought to be alarmed at this. Well, why would I be alarmed if I'm just asleep? In other words, there are these implications from the language, but you don't have anything spelled out. Yeah. Uh, you know, that it's interesting thing. you brought up going to be with the fathers. Mm-hmm. So you see this, you know, in Abraham's death, right? About going to be with his fathers. Um, later, it's not until later Jewish interpreters. Um, so if you fast forward into the like first century, say Alexandrian Philo, um, Philo of Alexandria would, will say of that text, and this is a common tradition, is they'll say that going to be with the fathers doesn't mean like your burial plots with your fathers. It means the father's celestial mm-hmm. who rule in heaven. So he's going to join them now. And so I, I don't, do I think that's implicit in Genesis? No, I don't actually think it's there, but, but the, it's how they're interpreting it later. So it, there's layers on the old Testament. So even going to Ecclesiastes, it's kind of anachronistic. So to say that, um, anachronistic, I'm, I just mean, it's not, we're, we're taking our time and imputing it back on theirs. Um, cause in Ecclesiastes, they maybe Ecclesiastes didn't have a developed afterlife. That doesn't mean there objectively isn't one. Right. So, you know, just because Ecclesiastes may not have some developed eschatology, we wouldn't expect it. to. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, you know, with, when, with David's, you know, work that we've, we've talked about on the podcast about, you know, they shall be as the stars and whatnot. You could see where, Somebody could be reading these Old Testament texts, which don't say a great deal, again, about very, they don't lay out a specific afterlife theology, but they, they say things that you can draw implications from. You could see how someone later could be reading that. And again, have in mind, you know, the glorification idea, and then, you know, sort of ask a simple mental question. Well, that, that was a long time ago. So, you know, maybe we're like part of the eschaton, and then they could sort of glom on, they could apply what's being said to their own 
you know, that's their own theology yeah. or situation. That's really good, actually, because I think most afterlife, and you can push back on this. If you, mm-hmm. I want to know what you think about it. I think most Jewish afterlife talk pre New Testament is eschatology. Mm-hmm. So I don't think, because it's interesting, because you don't have a separate discourse that's just afterlife, right? It's always. It's always a te- you always say glommed on. I don't know why you say that. I don't know no. what that means, but um, accrued. My, my vocabulary is not as developed, I guess. Um, but uh, it's not terribly fancy. Yeah, it's, whatever. So I think, my, it, it, I think my daughter taught me that. Okay. So just, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Vocab lessons with Heiser. Um, so yeah, the afterlife talk isn't. It doesn't appear to me in early Jewish literature uh, to to be a separate conversation than eschatology. So that, that, that is interesting though. Why? Because the, the idea of soul sleep comes from that. I think this, this, the, people are seeing that they're seeing that, Oh, it's attached to eschatology. And so they, it would be natural sort of inclination without more critical eyes on these traditions to think that, Oh, that's only in the end time. Yeah. But we I've, know for sure before the new yeah. Testament that Jews believed uh, all sorts of things about the afterlife. I, I would only say that I, I think, what do we mean by afterlife? Do we mean destiny? Because that's right, what right. he's talking about death with, the, with the eschatology yeah, yeah, stuff. Do we mean destiny or do we mean some sort of you know, conscious existence? Okay, now, the destiny arc is really, is really easy to see because of the glorification language and, and, and whatnot. But again, if, if you go to the burial practices of the time, again, they're they're doing what they're doing because they think that my aunts, you know, my my family member, when they are in the afterlife, which is where they're at now, they're going to find these things useful, or we're going to do these, you know, like food offerings and drink offerings. That there is an idea that isn't destiny, but it is. It's like right now, there's something going on over there. They're part of the spiritual world, but it's never articulated and spelled out. So you have you actually have right. two sides of this coin. You got destiny, which is which is yeah. probably arguably the big one. And then you've got this other sort of sense that, again, there's just something going on over there. But I, I just don't see you know, soul sleep as a really, to me, it would be really hard uh, to argue that point you know, from Scripture. Because when I've run across it, what, what you really see is just, just the vocabulary, like from the English Bible or an English translation. And people you know, seize that and they kind of go with it. I think it would be difficult uh, to argue that. You know. You know, a good pathway into that, I think, to, to sort of, if, if you're interested in sort of refuting that, it is people who think that way, like there's just soul sleep and then, you know, something later in the future. I think the presupposition behind that position is that they don't believe that eternal life begins at the coming of the Spirit. Because I think that's, that, I think that's a big deal in the New Testament. Uh, and I think this is where Paul actually gets his idea that uh, it, death is the end of sin, hmm. right? That uh, is that once someone has become like a pneumatic, they've become a spirited person, you know, that that is a sign of celestial life already in the present. So it's like you've already started your transformation. And Paul even uses the metamorphosis terms that would be common in yeah, no, Greek, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, like he's metaphysical science. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually, when you do studies on that. You just do a word study on, on 2 Corinthians 3. It'll trip you out. But, um, but that, that idea that the metamorphosis for like immortal life has already started in the present. So if that's already started in your physical state for Paul, the assumption is it that can, continues. Yeah, there's, there, it's, it's not interrupted. Like you don't start sleep. transforming yeah. and then like, right. oh, hit pause real quick. Right. You know, or it's yeah, he's it's, dead. It's, hit pause. Be, it's bedtime you know? <laughs> now, and you'll wake up. Later yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I, and but but that's interesting in Paul though because he's he, the, you can tell that he still has this sort of out of body afterlife view. I didn't used to think this, I, um, but I, I, I'm almost positive now that he thinks this is he has this out of body to afterlife view, but that's not what he's thrusting all the time. He's always thrusting resurrection. So even, even the, I don't want to sound like NT right here because we disagree on so much on this, but, but, um, but I do agree with the part where Wright talks about that 
it's not about the afterlife per se. It's about the after afterlife, you know? And so I agree with that part. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's actually a good way to put it. Any, so anybody even else? if you do have the, you know, afterlife afterwards, it's not the main thrust anyways. So other questions in that same kind of that same conversation, what about the words of Jesus when he talks about rich man and Lazarus and he kind of lays out this thing with Abram's bosom, Hades, is Jesus just telling a, you know, a unique story or is he speaking from yeah, I'm, experience? I'm not opposed to that, you know, being a parable because that's usually where the discussion's at. I kind of take all of those things and sort of put them in the same bucket that they are ways of talking about the afterlife. In other words, I don't, I don't look at a, a passage like that and say, oh, well, now like we have a we have a physical description of the afterlife and that we can plot it out on a map and it's got latitude and longitude and we could make a drawing. And I think they're all just ways of describing, uh, here you go with destinies because it's very obvious in, in Luke 16, there's a good destiny and a bad destiny. Mm -hmm. So I think they're talking about destinies and, and just what happens on the other side, you know, uh, what goes on on the other side. And, and we, I mean, we still do this now because we have to. We're embodied beings. So we talk about people when they die, when they, they pass over. And that's spatial language, like it implies distance and a journey. And again, we, we're forced to do that because that's the only way we can sort of comprehend that kind of transition. You know, it, so I think, you know, the, the biblical writers are doing the same thing and they just do it in different ways. You know, they have, they have different, uh, you know, metaphors for describing you know, what, where a person is now, you know, in the, in the afterlife and, and, and what their destiny is going to be and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't put too much sort of literal stock into it as though I could use this to, to like construct, you know, what it looks like. But I, I do take it seriously that it, it reflects, again, this, this notion of there's the good, good place in the afterlife, there's a bad place and, and all that sort of stuff. I want to say so. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> So, yeah, I don't want to harp on whether it's, too, it's, I think it is a parable, but, yeah. but I, but, and most scholars do, I, I don't but have any that, problem Right. But saying it, so this is not a, this is not a mutually exclusive thing though. I mean, just saying it's a parable doesn't mean it has, doesn't have an ontological referent for the hearers. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just saying that, you know, I'll, I'll just put it this way. It's ironic that so many preachers will take that text to talk about heaven and hell when that's not what the text is about. I mean, the text is any, any ontological referent to an afterlife is just playing on language that they already sort of folk know. It's the point of it is the ethics of it. Who is God vindicating? And it's the opposite mm -hmm. of what they would assume. Yeah, that's easy. That's the point that's of easy the text. To lose. The point yeah. isn't, yeah, the point of the text isn't like, let me teach you this scholarly vision of what heaven is like. You know, it's Abraham's bosom. He's really large. You know, it's like, like <laughs> you know, no, no, he's sorry. Been, he's been working out. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham's become like, you know, mm -hmm. Metatron, you know, or something, you know. Well, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> but um, but the, the point, the point is, you know, that's not the thrust of the passage. Who's being vindicated in that text? Right. Yeah, exactly. That's literally luke's point and he never shuts up about that so um that's a theme throughout the entire gospel so it to try to use that text I, man i just want to bang my head on the wall when i read mm -hmm. even commentaries do it trying to mm -hmm. say something about the yeah, afterlife I, with it yeah. i just don't think that's at all the point of it you know yeah it, it, and again it again i'm not it, saying no, it's not no but it reflects what has the, afterlife speculation quote right, unquote but right. that's as far as i'll go I won't say anything about its ontology. Right. It's, see, if you think about it, again, it, it reflects what people are thinking. Like David said, they, they sort of have this vocabulary. They have these ideas already. Because if they didn't, if Jesus goes into this and it's right and, and it's totally new, they're like, well, what's he talking about? So, again, it, it obviously reflects a belief, you know, about you know, what we're, we're talking about, the afterlife. But, yeah, you're right. It's easy to lose, you know, the other. Right. So one more <laughs> thing about that. I think. This is this is a trajectory we miss a lot in these texts is uh, and you have this in a lot of afterlife texts, actually, is you, you have these assumed beliefs. Who's in on it? You know, how does it happen? All these kinds of things, all this kind of eschatological speculation in early Judaism that goes into the New Testament that 
a lot of the ways that that topic gets brought up in the New Testament tend to be subversive. And so they're not, they're, they're trying to reframe how you think about who's there, you know? So a lot of that goes into the conversation and we all sort of know that when we're doing polemics like that, so like sort of attacking someone's current view of who's in and who's out and reframing it. If that's the thrust of the text, there's only so much you can say beyond it of to like, well, what's the real sort of, what does this mean eschatologically, right? For us, like scientifically or whatever, because they're just not giving you that, you know, it's more about reframing the audience's view of, oh, well, what, what is going to happen? Who's, yeah, who's it, there? It gets them to know? think about their relationship. To yeah, God it's, it's really, I think I would say it's more about ethics than it is ontology. It's not mm -hmm. saying that it's not about ontology. It's just saying it's more about ethics. Anybody else? Well, I have my own question, but I, I want to get to the question that actually my pastor wanted to ask you. Um, he was hoping to come tonight, but some things kind of stopped it. So his question is, what kind of criticism and pushback have you gotten in regards to the work you've done? Um, especially people from different theological camps, such as Pentecostals and Evangelical. Um, did you see any longtime theologians maybe change their minds? You know, that, that, that's, a good, that's a really good question because I actually had a conversation relevant to that two days ago. Um, in terms of reviews, I haven't had any, any substantive criticism, you know, like in terms of, oh, we just hate this book and it's just you know, out to lunch. Or, no, nobody's, nobody's doing that. You know, on the popular level, yeah. you can look at Amazon. Well, yeah, every, everybody gets shot it's at. So, up. yeah. Well, I, and, and don't let me forget that because um, yeah, yeah. there's something I, I want to say about that too. So, no, the reviews, both on the popular level and, you know, appearing in journals, like Ben Witherington spent a huge amount of time on it. He had like a nine-part review on his website, and, you know, we, we, we talked about that, and he really enjoyed the book. I've, I've gotten emails, you know, comments, you know, in, in personal conversation, just across the board. Pentecostals, people in Reformed Presbyterian churches, Reformed Baptists, traditional Baptists, Anglicans, I mean, it just... I mean, I, I could show you emails from like practically every denomination, it, it's, which is nice because the book doesn't say anything about denominational distinctives. I'm not, I'm not there to shoot at any of them, and I'm not there to promote any of them. And people actually like notice that. So that's really rewarding, you know, that I've, I'm just getting a lot of feedback from a lot of places. That's what I, I really hope to see. Now, a couple of days ago, we were on an escalator, and Mark Futado you know, spied me. Futado is a is a Hebrew prof uh, at a Reform seminary, and you know we've we've known each other uh, for a number of years because he went out and did some mobile ed stuff for us. But he came you know, he came over and he said he said I just want to let you know he goes, I'm I'm reading you know your book now for the second time. And he said I just love it. You know, and he actually said it has changed my thinking about several things. And he gave me a few specific examples. He said, but now, you know, I'm, I'm doing the second read through and, you know, now I'm, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, what, how I would apply this and, and how I would, you know, use this or that. So I, I get that again from a variety of traditions, but there you go. It's, you know, it's two days old. Eventually though, you know, they, the, the book's been so successful that Lexham is relaunching it. And what that means is they, act, they actually hired a publicist to actually do things. Uh, it's not just me anymore. And so I, I've been on several, um, you know, pretty large shows. I just got booked. If anybody, by the way, if anybody watches this guy, I'd, I'd like to talk to you before you leave. Uh, I just got booked on the Eric Metaxas show. And, and I, I've, I know the name, but I've never seen the show. And I've talked to a couple of people like, who's this guy? You know, like, what does he do? So uh, what I told the people at Lexham is, on the one hand, this is great, you know, that you're like relaunching this thing. And it's going to get, you know, wider exposure and whatnot. But I said, you, gotta, you have to realize that it's not just going to, like, continue to, to trend up. The haters are going to come out. People are going to read this and hate the book. So you, you guys got to just be prepared for that. So, I, you know, I didn't want to, like, rain on my own parade. But that's just the truth. It, it, that's the truth with everything. You know, Anything Walton can write. Anything. Right. Walton, N.T. Wright, you know, the, these guys that write lots of stuff, they, they get shot at all the time. I'm not going to be any different. You know, Walton was, you know, he was uh, a little, little perturbed this week, you know, at some of the things, you know, said about uh, him in a session at ETS. It just happens. And, and he, 
he's a big boy. I mean, he knows that. It, it, it's not the first time it's happened. That's just the way it is. So I expect, you know, pushback to be what it is, and that's just that's just going to happen. So, okay. Have you had any other pushback? Um, from who? Any what was it? Scholars or pastors? No, I, I, not, not to this point. You know, I haven't, um, all the, all the published reviews, nobody's like come up to me, you know, and said something nasty. Uh, again, I, I know that because I use a lot of the, the published literature, I know who's on what side of different things. But the point, of, what, what I'm hoping people grasp, including, you know, again, the people who are going to be critical of it, because they'll surface, is that look, the goal of the book is not to say that Mike has now figured out a theory of everything. That is not the goal. It's also not the goal that to like the book, you have to agree with everything, every position Mike takes. The goal is what can the text sustain and operating on the assumption that the biblical person, biblical writers, were very predisposed to a supernatural worldview. How would you read this as a collective whole, you know, like a worldview, a framework? And, you know, Again, if I can anticipate, you know, objections, it's like, look, guys, you know, look, fellow scholar, believe it or not, the biblical people are not us. Okay, we are products of the Enlightenment. We are. That is what we are. They are not. So if you're like uptight and, you know, you, you sort of get your knickers in a, see, I can't complete the the phrase. You probably know that one better than I do. Um you know, if if you just get uptight, you know about uh, you know what what what's going on in the book or what I'm what I'm sort of challenging the reader with. Too bad, you know, because they're not us. Like, prove to me that they would have thought the way we do about X Y Z passage. That's what I want to see. You know, so that's the overall message. You know, to try to to really understand a, a number of things in the Bible and and also the way they connect. See so that the connection points are important to me sort of why they're there, how they how this passage would connect to this one. To really be able to do that, you have to, again, have the Israelite in your head, the first century Jew in your head. That means you have to be able to read it like an ancient person would. Now, you know, what we do with that, you know, is, is again, you know, up, up to us with the application of what, how, we, how we teach certain things, how we would, you know, discuss certain things in certain passages today. I, I understand that. But when the, when the biblical writer wrote this or that verse or this or that passage, he was not a product of the Enlightenment. What he's thinking is going to be, in some ways, fundamentally different than the way we think. That's all I'm saying. And to me, that's really, really obvious. But it, it's going to trouble some people because they've sort of camped, you know, on certain positions in certain passages, and they just, they don't want to, you know, sort of entertain, you know, those, those kind of thoughts. So it'll come, you know, I'm We'll just wait and see. Did you marry that your pastor's question to your own question, or uh, no? I, my question is actually. So I'm a first year seminary student right now. Mm -hmm. I just started this past September, and <clears throat> one of the things. So I've mentioned your material before, and like my pastor got into it. His dad is a pastor. He got into it. It was great, but one of the things that I'm kind of trying to figure out because I've gotten questions back regarding. Well, this material sounds great. It, we we agree with a lot of it, but what's the practical ministry kind of application? Mm -hmm. um, and and for me in seminary, that's kind of one of the questions I constantly am trying to think of. Like, I can great, get all this great head knowledge, and just like Paul said, knowledge can puff up. And so, how does the information like the unseen I, realm? I think if I think if you understand. The way I, I would answer that sort of in a, in quick mode is that I, I believe, and I think that the book you know shows this, that God's relationship to spirit spirit beings, His heavenly host, okay, the divine council, all that stuff, serves as a template for the way God looks at us, the way God thinks about us, what we're tasked with, our participation in God's program. If if you see those things, then then those should generate other things. Oh, participation in God's program. You mean like not everything is predestined? You know, what we do actually matters. Uh, again, a simple thing like reclaiming the nations. Th this isn't really new stuff. This is again, this in some ways helps us frame what we're supposed to be doing. You know, it, it, what is this thing called the kingdom? You know, we again, we we. I'm, I'm sure David has a lot of thoughts on this, but we the way, especially in evangelicalism, we think about church and kingdom. It it can be very, um, mm. very 
very traditional, very uh, sort of bent on, you know, certain things, certain trajectories. Um, but I, I, I just think it argues for sort of the, the, the bigness of how we propel God's rule, you know, on earth. And I'm not a theonomist. So that, that is one place where it's not, you know, yeah. we're, we're not looking at to apply. When I think kingdom rule and spreading the rule of God on earth, I'm not thinking theonomy. I'm thinking of actually winning people, changing hearts and minds, and letting the Spirit of God change them, and then they can interact with other people where they're at and repeat the process. It's an entirely replicatable process. So, again, I think the the angelic stuff and all that, again, is interesting, and I I camp out there a lot. But what I'm trying to get people to, to sort of think about is you can learn a lot about the way God looks at you and the way God looks at what he wants us to do and our membership in his family, which takes us into sanctification and evangelism and missions and reclaiming the nations, all this sort of stuff. Uh, you, you can learn a, a, to think about that a little bit better, a little more fully, if you understand, again, this, this angelology stuff. So th- that's just one trajectory. There are other trajectories um, in terms of, you know, some sort of practical application. I'll just say one more thing. I'll turn it over to David. W- when I hear that, and I know this isn't what's meant, but when I hear that, it's because I have had people tell me this. This is why I think of it. Well, what's the practical implication? I have had people just point blank tell me, you know, learning all this theology stuff is kind of useless. Theology is useless. I, I, you know, it's hard for me not to think of, you know, and I didn't, I didn't go off on, you know, the person that that is thinking this, but it's like, you know, dude, how can you say that? I mean, that's like being biblically illiterate. You know, just how how can you think that thought? Because what theology is supposed to do is it's supposed to make you think about your relationship with God. I mean, just at at a fundamental level and how God, you know, wants to interact with you and, and what he has planned for you, your destiny, your purpose, who you are. Theology is supposed to do that. Um, Christology, imaging. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, the, the, and imaging is a huge concept in the book. So it, it just seems to me that if if we can't sort of connect those dots, then maybe we need to you know spend more time really introspectively trying to figure out those sorts of questions. My immediate answer when you ask that, because I was a pastor applying this stuff to. Um, the easiest answer to the practical outworking of thinking through um, celestial hosts over nations is political theology. This is politics we're talking about. And we in the modern West that are a product of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, John Locke, uh, the sort of deistic kinds of views of politics and religion separating church and state, a completely foreign concept to the pre-enlightenment world, doesn't exist. Politics is religion in the ancient world, and religion is politics in the ancient world. There's no distinction at all. Um, uh, the cult in a temple is where the king deity rules his land from. It's all politics. Oh, that's where the treasury is. That's the IRS of the ancient world is where the God is. So um, so th- this is political theology we're talking about. If you understand this worldview, it will fundamentally, from the bottom up, reframe the way you think about yeah, politics. Who is, who is your king? And it, you, you, you have to think about... If, so th- just an example of what I'm talking about. So if you think of Exodus, right? You have an enslaved people to foreign gods, and God says that in this night, in the Passover, is where I'll judge the gods of Egypt, right? Or have victory. What is it? Have victory over the gods of Egypt? Yeah, I think it depends he on the translation. Yeah, def- yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and the so the purchase of Israel is a religious. It's a divine sort of situation, but it is a political situation. It's literally delivering them from a. Uh, 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 a false oppressive political regime and they would not be able to distinguish between those two things. And that is precisely the language and the theology of baptism in the new Testament. This is how baptism is discussed in the new Testament. It is a new Exodus. You pass through the waters 
You're baptized into the name. The new citizenship. The new citizenship. You have been transferred, past tense, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Well, what? who's in the kingdom of darkness? Every nation not baptized. So if you're a native, you're treated as a foreigner, right? You're a foreigner in your native lands. You're in exile. This is not your home. Your citizenship is in heaven. You're in the Jerusalem above. You know, these, th- this, this language only makes sense if they literally believe that there is inaugurated king over the world that right now as they're speaking. It's, that's where all the darkness and blindness language comes in in the New mm-hmm. Testament. And this is where, not to push back too hard against Mike here, but I don't like when people say, um, build his kingdom or something like that. I hate that language. Because it's already in place. Yes. Yeah. the king, Basilia Tutheu is the reign of God. God reigns right now. We're declaring a by, fact by the way, I'm, the case. I'm not denying that. Okay, I know. I know. <laughs> I just don't like the verbiage because people yeah. don't have the teaching to back up what yeah. that means. So the, building the don't use that phrase because what we are announcing a reality, a fact. So we, we're not doing anything substantial in that sense. So anything that happens is a result of the power of the spirit. So we're announcing a reality that right now people are walking around, not thinking and going to the voting booth and doing their normal politics thing and not thinking that right now, as we're breathing his air, Jesus is Lord of the whole earth. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the whole already part is where evangelical political theology stinks. It stinks because we're not acting as if Jesus is Lord right now, you know? And and so we're not actually facing the sort of apocalyptic pushback from the powers that we might feel if we actually embodied that ethic in the world. And so the question is, it, it's, and we all believe this at, at our core as mm-hmm. Christians, is that the proclamation that we make when we go through the baptismal waters is there is another king than Caesar, and there is another emperor of the world, and he's one that doesn't slaughter his people. He, he dies for them. And it's the one who, when he rules, he doesn't say, like Caesar's gospel, because Caesar has a gospel too, right? He has a uh, euangelion that he proclaims and he has messengers he sends out too to preach the Pax Romana, Roman peace, you know. Uh, you know, we bring peace to the world and the gods have chosen the sun to rule the whole world, you know. And uh, you look at things like the Prean inscription that has Augustus as the son of God and a gospel and, you know, peace to the world and blah, blah, blah. And, and uh when when they hear that gospel, they they'll tell them to repent as well. But it's not <laughs> it's not it's not a sort of welcoming to the family. It's like we're taking this land and we're going to kill you if you're not down, right? <laughs> so you have the exact opposite in Jesus's political theology: is that he's sitting there bleeding on a Roman cross and saying things like, "Yeah, I could call down legions of angels right now," and that's again that's. If you're thinking legion in the Roman Empire, you know this language, right? I mean, this is very subversive language to be saying as you're dying on a Roman death tool, you know. I could call down legions right now, but he doesn't. And and he is reigning in that sense. So the way we think of power, the way we think of rule is so conditioned by this world that we think when the God's kingdom comes, it's just like this, this world's rulers. He's going to crush everybody and rah, rah, rah. But his kingdom did come and no one recognized it. You see, it's, 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 it's the gospel of John. If my kingdom were of this world, you would, my servants would fight. You see? So, this, this, so it's political theology we're talking about. Divine counsel is about political theology. I, I actually got, got into that on one live stream that we did at the coffee shop, if anybody saw that. But, you know, the, the, again, just to, to Sorry, uh, no, just, just the quick path there is I was talking about um, what, what it would be like if we had a bunch of people that believe so strongly in, again, the kingdom of God, you know, that Christ's rule, that they were willing to do what the apostles did. Okay, they, they view their task, again, not as the exercise of power, again, over other people, 
but their task is to again change hearts and minds you know get you know people to believe the gospel to essentially join them in this effort and they were willing to die for it if you really think about it if you have a bunch of people willing to die for that and people you know see this kind of suffering and again the old cliche but it's really not a cliche the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church that that's that's a historical thing where where people see you know christians you know being put to death for just being christians and that you know provokes questions like well why why are why are we doing that to them and why are they willing to have it done to them so you know, it, it actually grows as, as Christians are willing to do that. And if you really think about it, that is an unstoppable force because you can't kill it off. Killing it or trying to kill it makes it grow. Okay? You, it, it's just an unstoppable thing. But, but we don't really consciously think in those terms. Uh, I, I think I, I got into that when, when somebody asked a, sort of a, a similar question, and I had blogged about it about, you know, using ISIS as the analogy. And if you're an ISIS, you wake up every day and what, what can I, right, what can I do to, you know, restore the caliphate or whatever? In other words, you're consumed by the thought of serving your God and then doing what, what, whatever is necessary to accomplish this mission. And on the reverse, you know, if, if, if we had Christians that sort of woke up every day with that thought, they went to sleep and their last thought was, what can I do tomorrow? You know, but again, it's defined as, you know, the, the gospel message if we had the same sort of single-mindedness as these people do in mass, how could you get rid of that? Yeah. Uh, along the lines with bringing in the willingness to die part, uh, just get, I'm not plugging my own episode here. I'm just saying it, it, this is the only thing that makes the resurrection intelligible. It's the only thing that makes it make sense because the, the, if you attach like Paul does, resurrection to the death of the powers which is so interesting that he does that right is it in a discourse all about resurrection in first Corinthians 15 the only narration we get of what the heck is happening uh, as a result of that is the destruction of these rulers and that's what it means to be resurrected it's attached to this idea is that it's a vindication of the real authorities in the world and a destruction of the false ones the or the evil ones this is so it's not like you get to become sons of god with your golden ticket that you cash in in the end that's not the idea it's that you, you, this that's inter romans 8 right is this idea that the sons of god they're already walking around they're already doing the kingdom stuff in, in th so they're already the whole creation paul says in romans 8 is groaning waiting for the apocalypse the revealing of the sons of god not the making mm -hmm. of the sons of god the revealing of the fact that they're there so you're you're walking around doing life and then the resurrection occurs this last day and it's revealed in glory that these pauper old women feeding all these poor mouths are actually the lords of the world. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it, it's a completely different way of thinking about who are the real rulers of this thing, you know? Yeah, so if, it is a, it is, it's very much a political thing if, again, if, that we've depoliticized. To, to reduce that, you know, I, I, I keep going back to, do you really believe this world is not your home? You know, we, we sing that song. But if you really believe that, well, that, this is how you're going to be thinking. You, of course, you're willing to die because, well, you know, this really isn't my home and I'm going to be resurrected. And, you know, it's the already but not yet. You know, you're in, at, a, at a crisis moment like that, you know, you're focused on, uh, you know, the, the resurrection event because uh, you're willing to lay down this life because you know the next one is, is yours, you know, to inherit. And if you really think that, if you really believe that, then that ought to be like the most practical thing in the world. I mean, what, what, what would like be more practical than that? So I, I, again, you know, I, I understand why the, why the question is asked, but again, it goes back to inheritance, sonship, membership in the family, what's your destiny? These are all the major themes of, you know, unseen realm because of the major themes of, of this worldview. So again, it just, 
like Dave said, we all, we all sort of know this already. So it's nothing new, but I think it, it, it sort of fleshes it out, uh, you know, a, a lot more and anything that will sort of stimulate our thinking to think about that stuff in a different way yeah. is good to do because it's really important. We should move on. Any yeah. other question? This came out of a Bible study that I was in a couple days ago and we were um, reading Jonah chapter one. Um, and after Jonah gets thrown into the sea, it says in verse 16, so the men feared Yahweh greatly and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Um, and so in this Bible study, uh, each person has to come up with a question. You don't have to, but you're allowed to ask a question about the passage. Mm -hmm. So my question was, did those men become converts? Did they become, you know, did they renounce their other gods and become followers of Yahweh exclusively? Um, and somebody in the Bible study said, well, they would have had to be circumcised to do that. And it doesn't say Very for sure if they were or not. So we don't really know for sure, but it kind of sounds like they were pretty convinced that, you know, he was the God of gods mm -hmm. at the end of the passage. And then I was wondering if, if that's really the case, if you would have had to be circumcised in like before Jesus in the old Testament. Um, and then also what about the Gentile women who became converts? <laughs> what about the Jewish women? <laughs> Right. Yeah, so re read, read the Jonah right. verse. Yeah. <laughs> read, read the, uh, yeah, read the verse, the, the Jonah verse again. But just, just start from the ver first verse, if it's only a few verses in. It's, it was in Jonah 1, right? Yeah. Okay. You Do you just start want at the me beginning, to... yeah. Okay. At the beginning of the chapter? Yeah. Okay. And the word of Yahweh came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Get up, go to the great city Nineveh, and cry out against her, because their evil has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee toward Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh, and he went down to Joppa and found a merchant ship going to Tarshish, and paid her fare, and went on board her to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh. And Yahweh hurled a great wind upon the sea, and it was a great storm on the sea, and the merchant ship was in danger of breaking up. And the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they threw the contents that were in the merchant ship into the sea to lighten it for them. And meanwhile, Jonah went down to the hold of the vessel and lay down and fell asleep. And the captain of the ship approached him and said to him, Why are you sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will take notice of us and we won't perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this disaster has come on us. And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Please tell us whoever is responsible that this disaster has come upon us. What is your occupation, and from where do you come? What is your country, and from which people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were greatly afraid, and they said to him, What is this you have done? Because they knew that he was fleeing from the presence of Yahweh, because he had told them. So they said to him, What shall we do to you so that the sea may quiet down for us? Because the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea so that the sea may quiet down for you, because I know that on account of me this great storm has come upon you all. But the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to the dry land, and they could not do so because the sea was growing more and more tempestuous against them. So they cried out to Yahweh, and they said, O oh, Yahweh, please do not let us perish because of this man's life, and do not make us guilty of innocent blood, because you, O oh, Yahweh, did what you wanted. And they picked Jonah up and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. So the men feared Yahweh greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to get the whole context there so everybody hears it. It's hard to know from that passage whether we have, you know, I use the academic term, whether we have a bunch of henotheists now, <laughs> that Yahweh is the biggest and baddest of the deities. You know, in, in other words, they're not, they're not exclusively devoted to him mm -hmm. like, like converts. 
uh, that's that's more likely again just because of the of the ancient mentality, especially you know for a pagan. That's that's more likely in my mind than the uh, the alternative that well we're not going to believe you know in it we're not we're never going to do a religious thing with respect to any of these other gods that we started out the passage calling on because they call on their own gods so it, I think it's I don't think we have enough detail to determine whether we have a conversion here what at least we have is we have a recognition of you know the, the might of Yahweh and if, you know again to use our modern way of talking about these things that could sort of you know be a testimony to them or an indication that maybe they're they're you know moving down a path toward that but I don't think we can really conclude that they've sort of you know wound up as being a like a, like Abraham you know a faithful follower of, of Yahweh that sort of thing and I think it says a little bit too much there were some follow up elements to your question. So my friend at the Bible study had said that the reason that we don't know for sure is because it doesn't say whether or not they got circumcised and that yeah. if they were going to become converts, they would have had to be circumcised. Yeah, I, I would, again, I'm going to go back to my while we were yet sinners sermon. Again, I think it's, I think it's significant that Jesus uses Na- Naaman and the widow of Zarephath as examples of faith. So as I said in that sermon, I don't, I don't know if you heard it, but here's a guy Jesus uses as an example of faith over against the scribes and the Pharisees. And so if he's good enough for Jesus, he's good enough for me. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is, would Jesus really hold up this man and this woman as an example of faith if, again, he, he didn't think that, okay, now we've switched allegiance here? Because right. what, what Naaman, we don't have really any, any details with the widow of Zarephath. There's very little there. But with Naaman, it's like, I want dirt because now I'm going to sacrifice only to the Lord. I mean, there are things in the passage that indicate this, this change of mind in a, in a really, you know, wow. black or white kind of sort of way. But here's a guy that he's never going to go to temple. He's going to go back to Syria. He's never going to observe the festivals. He didn't ask, you know, the, the prophet, hey, can I have a copy of the Torah? He's, he's never going to really know much that an Israelite would know. He's, there's no indication he's going to get circumcised and do the feasts and you know, do the calendar, all that stuff. What he knows is really simple, but it happens to be the first and greatest commandment. You know, I shall have no gods before me. That's his theology. And he's, he's, he's taken that to the bank. You know, he, he's going all, all the way whole hog with that. And Elisha says, you know, good for you. You know, take as much dirt as you can carry. You know, shalom. So th- this whole business about this assumption that people had to do things in the law to be in right relationship with Yahweh, I, I think it's just, it's just not correct. I mean, it's, it's, it's drastically overstated, and it, it really is sort of this presumptive kind of thing based on like the New Testament Judaizing content, because that's what they're telling the Gentiles mm-hmm. to do. So that sort of gets read back into the Old Testament in these kind of episodes. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't. That would require them still being Gentiles. Yeah, they, they were. They were. There was still this category of kind of you know the the righteous Gentile. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment and yeah. judge you. Yeah, we have no record of the Queen of Sheba converting to Yahwism. We know she gave truck tons of money to the temple, like more than Israel had ever seen, and because of the wisdom of Solomon, like that. That Solomon's God, man, this is the wisest guy ever to bring the treasures to the temple. And so, yeah, that is basically worshiping a God in the ancient world. But it doesn't say that she's now a Yahwist and she signed it's, up for yeah, her, hard, you know, Israeli know. calendar. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, and I think I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't want to be anachronistic here, but I think the things you see in Acts, especially with Peter, I think that's the big one with Peter when, when he says that it's the, some realization to him. But because it was a realization to him doesn't mean it wasn't the case. It's that he just realized this fact is that God doesn't show partiality to those who fear him. And so, and you have the whole God fearing tradition. They're not Jews, but they, man, God of Israel, man. That's, yeah, yeah. And, and about, about the women, I, there's some, I can't remember which, which it might be in Dare You Not to Boring with the Bible. And I, and I may have blogged about it too. And again, this is just my take. I think circumcision also was a sign to Israelite women because of the restrictions on marriage. You had to marry a, a you know an Israelite guy. You're going to have your, mm. your males circumcised. So 
basically every time they have sex, it's like, you know, th- th- you have both a visual, you know, you, you get this reminder mm. uh, and, and it, it's a, it's a covenantal reminder. And so when we have our, our, our baby boy, we do the same thing and we're supposed to marry, you know, within the tribe, you know, so to speak, all that. So it, that that difference that practice was not like missed by women it, it it's still an evident thing in their culture and they're gonna they're gonna learn from that they're gonna, they're gonna have this lesson this idea reinforced to them so they're not excluded in, in terms of the importance of of the sign there are a couple of specific things about jonah too in that text that sort of stand out in relation to the question is the vows they take so that would those are more than likely have like cultic context to them. So if you're, if you're, it's one thing to like praise a God, it's another thing to make vows to one. So the, in, in Jonah's context, and you have to understand that everything is stylistic in Jonah as well. So um, it, that's foregrounding. It's like foreshadowing the situation with Nineveh that's coming. Right. It's like, and so, you know, the, the only ones praising God, in the end are these Gentiles and Jonah's in the yeah. sea, you know, it's like there yeah. Nineveh's well, he's, he's re- repenting and there's Jonah complaining yeah. out in the tree still, yeah. you know, under the tree. So, or the vine or whatever, you know, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of stylistic stuff going on there um, where it's kind of like on Jonah. Um, so, you know, it depends on how far you want to push it. You know, is Jonah actually trying to say something about like, look at these new Gentile converts. Let's focus on them. Not really, no. I mean, yeah. but it's it's not saying that's not important. I actually think the vows thing is very important, actually. You, you could... Um, you could there's some sort it. of Yahweh devotion now that's established yeah. with them. Yeah, I would I would say that there's, there's at least this impulse, again, this recognition that's going on. You know, and you, and you could, I mean, just to pick up David's point, you could bookend. Okay, the bookends... You know, with Jonah sitting there complaining about why the Gentile conversion. So, if you want to, you could, you could make the argument that okay, literarily, the book ends with this opposition, and then you could read that back. You could read the conversion of Nineveh back to the sailors. You could do that, but again, I I would just need more. Uh, I, I need more of an indication for that. So it, it would depend on on how deliberate you yeah. think that is. Um, yeah. You know, it, it would be nice, you know, to see something drawn more specifically from chapter four about, you know, the, the way they respond to the, to the message of repentance. Cause you know, in, in a way I'd want to see that, but it, it might be a little unfair because in that part of the story in chapter one, they're not really asked, you know, there, there's no like gauntlet laid down mm. that they, this is your, de- your demarcation point, yeah. whose side, you know, you're on the Lord's side or not. But, you know, you, you could look at the passage that way, but I, I would just like to see more. But at the very least, there's this impulse, you know, this they've gained some knowledge of Yahweh here and it's pretty serious. And at the very least, you know, that that could, you know, influence their thinking uh, from that point on. So we, we just we don't know specifics beyond that. I definitely I definitely think it is part of the trajectory, sort of the, you know, post-exilic trajectory right. of Gentile inclusion as an eschatological phenomena, you know, cause he's supposed to go preach repentance and they do repent, you and know, it's it, like, and, and so it's this behold, it's welcoming Tarshish, of the nation. Flees to Tarshish, Exactly. You know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, so there's so much symbolism going on there, but, um, but that's really significant when you, when you get in readings of Jonah later and especially with the sign of Jonah that Jesus talks about, right. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'll only give you the sign of Jonah. And I always I don't know. I, I always wonder about that because yes, okay, the, the obvious three days, and then he comes out. Yeah, duh, death and resurrection. That's definitely in mind. I think there's a lot more in mind there because we're talking about Gentile inclusion is being, yeah. is happening at the proclamation of the gospel after this occurs, right? And he's the great and, prophet and of Jesus, Yahweh. And Jesus has tipped tipped that hand. I mean, we, we, it's easy for us to sit already here already in the gospel before right, he says that, right? So that's you know, like, like interesting with the, with the gathering, okay. You know he's he's in Gentile territory because hey they're raising pigs here that's really not what like Jews would do, so he, he'll go to these Gentile places and assert his kingship his authority and and the claim is pretty obvious I'm not just here for the Jews okay I'm I'm here for like everything mm-hmm. so he's he's tipped that that hand a little bit and you'd say well shouldn't shouldn't the the Jews have known that can't they read their Old Testament well yeah they. They they did have you know that and they were probably exposed to it but still in the gospels it's very clear that 
you know, Jesus has to teach this to them. Paul even refers to the full inclusion, the full inheritance of the Gentile as a mystery. Mm. You know, that, so it's hard to know, like, who got how much of the message right. when. But, it, I mean, it was there. But you, and you, you don't run into even, these episodes where, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. but you don't even need the New Testament for this. Like, right. y- y- I mean. You should be able to pick it up. Right. Uh, Isaiah is dealing with this. The Psalms even are read eschatologically this way, um, which you do see in the New Testament. But already beforehand, they're being used this way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the prophet's clearly talking about the Gentiles coming. In. Take Isaiah's typology and Jonah's after Isaiah. So, the, you know, there's probably way after. So there's definitely clear sort of uh, settings that people in a post-Isaiah world can draw on already within the Hebrew scriptural tradition mm-hmm. that look forward to the Gentiles themselves coming to the Mount of God. Not to get the snip-snip in Isaiah. It's saying the Gentiles actually coming and saying, yeah, teach me your ways. Now, some Jews would interpret that as, sure. well, this means they're going to Surely take they on must the be circumcised. Surely like they've got to yeah. be. Ca- yeah. Or if you're at Qumran, they're like the meal that they're eating, you know, or something. Um, th- th- there's weird ways of interpreting this in Judaism. Um, but, but uh, uh, well, and Christianity too. But, um, but, but the point being is there's already stuff in the prophets that sort of, you know, signals that. Mm-hmm. Like, because the, the, all the text that Paul's, making these cases for Gentile inclusion as Gentiles, which by the way, is still a pretty big problem in scholarship. I have friends writing papers on this still. Um, so, uh, but Paul's quoting Psalms and Isaiah mm-hmm. and texts from the Torah. So they're already thinking with ancient texts about Gentiles coming as Gentiles. It's just super controversial, you know, you, you can that's see why where... we have most of the New Testament actually is I mean, just this issue. Put yourself in, in, Let's just say we're here. We are in a synagogue in Asia Minor somewhere. You know, there, there's this nitwit Paul running around. You know, talking about Jesus of Nazareth. You're you're going to be opposed. I mean, if you don't believe that, you're going to be opposed to this guy and his message. And so, it, it's it's very easy to see how to sort of circle the wagons and protect your turf, your identity, taking these Old Testament things and then again filtering them through your own identity. Well, of course, if you want to be one of the people of God, then you get circumcised, you do the Sabbath, you do all these things. Even when the passages don't spell that out, they're, they're they just like, yeah, they're, they're just Gentiles, again, you know, coming to the Lord, to worship the Lord. There's even passages that talk about Gentiles being priests, you know, the Most High. I mean, they're, they're just stuff like that. But again, to well, not, to right, not, not to exclude the, the notion that the Pharisees and scribes are really, they're just protecting turf. But, but what I'm saying is you could see how easily they could do that. Paul's a Pharisee. You know, I know. But I mean, you know, well, that would offend them even I'm more. I'm just saying. It just ticks them off because they, he used to be with them. So He still you know, identifies as one. They're trying, you know, I, well, yeah, when he has to defend his, his street cred and all that. <laughs> Resurrection is pretty pharisaical. Well, I know. He's not a Sadducee. Okay, there you have it. So. <laughs> but... You know, you, you could you could see I'm, how they could get there, and then you have the whole Judaizing problem. But it, it's not I'll a problem a that problem. that arises from you know these Old Testament passages. I want but, Paul to still be a Jew. But we look we look at you know we look at the same at this kind of stuff, and is, isn't it interesting that the way we look at people like, are you really a Christian? You know, we actually sort of reflexively do the same thing. We make you know some work or some some deed or some ritual or whatever it is. Again, it's it's like we we mimic the Judaizers when we talk about Christians, and which is really sure. yeah. It's really and odd. in our interpretation of ancient Israel, we do the same thing to them. And uh, this is difficult conversation because there's I I'm not convinced that there is a monolithic view on this in the Old Testament uh, because there's laws that clearly say one thing and then you have narratives where they're doing something different and no one's condemned. Um, So it's just sort of like, okay, what's going on here? And you have rabbis playing with that later. Um, So, you know, obviously we're not trying to say this is just, Oh, well, here's the answer, you know, and get out of jail free card. So it's, it's more complicated obviously than that. And so Paul's still seems like he's still working stuff out too in his letters. So yeah, yeah. It's, that's a really I mean, good question. Paul, Paul because tough. Judaism, because there is no such thing as Second Temple Judaism, 
you know, singular. Right. You know, Paul is going to be saying certain things in certain ways, and he's he's probably you know thinking about a particular strain of Judaism. You know, and there's going to be many of them. What the problem for New Testament scholars is to try to reconstruct that conversation so they mm. know exactly what Paul is saying to whom, you know, what, what, what context fits, fits which group, what context fits, you know, which sort of you know, way of thinking that, that you can find in Judaism. That's really, it's called, that's kind of an impossible task. Yeah, it's but, so hard uh, yeah. to do that. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's hard to reconstruct every you know, detail. We can't. Yeah. 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 Another question. Hey, Mike, um, on your website, you have this like six part thread on Romans 512. Mm -hmm. Thought it was great. I've had a hard time trying to reconcile the doctrine of original sin with a just God and, uh, frankly, with just biblical texts in general, like the ones you bring up in Revelation and accountability. And uh, I'm wondering if you'd be able to kind of flesh out the journey of a human being from birth to, <clears throat> well, I don't know, accountability or and, and, and how that works out and and it's, it just yeah, seems to me I, I struggle is. less with that because, again, my, my view of Romans 5.12 is, is not that we're guilty because of what somebody else does. Right. So, you know, and, and again, you'll find that in Eastern Orthodoxy. You'll find it in certain uh, segments of Baptist circles. You know, we'll take that view. Um, it's, it's a minority view, certainly within anything that could be put into the evangelical bucket like Baptists. But the, the, the East is there as well. So... If that's the case, then you know our our accountability for God I think makes more sense because it's because we sin. So that that to me answers that particular question. So as far as the journey, I don't know that we have to recount the journey. I, I don't think we could. We could, I don't think we could possibly know when uh, you know when like like God looks at some act that a, a child does or whatever age. You know, and okay, this is this is a rebellion. You know, this is something in the heart. I just don't think we can know that. But I, I do think there is a category uh, of innocence because I, I, I take Romans 5.12, you know, the way I do with, in concert with those traditions. So the accountability issue seems to me pretty clear. You know, we're, we're accountable to, to God when and because we sin. But I, I, can't, I can't sort of create a typology for that. Or well, I, guess, I guess part of the doctrine of original sin kind of feeds to the idea of why we sin as well. In, in some threads. And I don't know, it also seems like it's kind of like this holy cow doctrine that if you come against, you're in big trouble. Well, if, yeah, I've, I've read, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've mentioned, I've mentioned this, this book before. And again, the same caveats. Don't, uh, if, if you got into this book and you found out that the author is a Mormon, don't let that freak you out because it, he's not doing Mormonism in the book. But when souls had wings, it's the book that's the history, the, an intellectual history of preexistence. So the, he does. There are several chapters that discuss why you know church fathers like Augustine sort of landed where they did on that issue. They all held some view of preexistence, and even Augustine says in several places that you know we're still thinking about this. All the ideas are worth thinking about, and he, you know he. He, he may not be positively pr be predisposed to embracing one thing over the other. He just says, I don't know, you know it's kind of hard. But, but he, he'll shift in his understanding based upon things that are going on around him. And that's the really interesting part of the book. The, his, his debates you know, with the Pelagians move him a little bit over this direction and not the other. Yeah, th there will be something else that, that someone else writes that he either likes or reacts to. And then when he, when he stakes out that turf over here, that influences the way he's going to look at something over here because he has to be consistent. He's, he's really hung up on predestination. And so that, that, according to Givens, who's the author, that's sort of the thing that nudged him away from the other views of the origin of the soul to a more uh, tradition, you know, position because, you know, then his predestination system just seemed to work better. So he actually sort of defaults, you know, to this. There's all this kind of stuff going on uh, in in the early church fathers, but because you have certain decisions made in the context of certain debates, and also in the context of interacting with other people that you may like or don't like with what they're saying, if you have a a, a really you know high status like Augustine did, 
the decisions you make are going to influence a tremendous number of people. And, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to build this reputation and you're going to become the reference point for doctrinal thinking about this issue over here. What did Augustine say? Yeah, it, it, it really is going to sort of be this, this you know, sort of unstoppable force within the Western church, you know, because people after Augustine are going to be very hesitant to disagree with him, even though he wasn't always where he landed, Okay. <laughs> But we sort of lose that debate. We, we lose the context. We lose the discussion. The question just becomes for us, well, what did Augustine say? You know, and, and, that, and that is another way of asking, what does our church tradition say? Because it's, it's built in part on some important thinkers like, like Augustine. So, it, yeah, uh, you know, it's a minority view. But I, I really do think it just makes the most sense, even not though it's East. contrary. Well, not in the East, it's not. Yeah. yeah, let's 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 be careful when we say minority because yeah. in the West, definitely. <laughs> we just pretend the Eastern Church doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> but that you know they've had a more consistent theology than the West has. And let's let's also keep in mind that that question is directly tied to the Eastern view of theosis. Yeah. So the, the the denial of original sin in the Augustinian sense in the West is the vehicle by which you get the high view of deification in the East. It's not that the West doesn't believe in deification. It's just the East is better at it, I think. I'm there, putting there the cards are, on the table. Well, there, there, are a number of, there are a number of listeners to the podcast that are you know, Eastern Orthodox. You know, I, I had, he doesn't work for Lagos anymore. He, he switched companies, but had a friend there in the building and, and that was one of his, his things that really drew him, you know, into listening to the podcast was the Romans five twelve stuff. Because again, the only place he's ever heard that is his own context. So, you know, there you have it. I mean, it, they, they've been there a long time mm -hmm. and, but in, in the West it's, it's dominated by other, it's other thinkers. I don't know. I've never really had any discussion with, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of people you know, theologians that are, again, part of the Western tradition that aren't going to like it. I mean, that, that's kind of obvious, but I've never had any, you know, discussion about it. Like, I've never done a paper on it or anything like that. It, you know, it's one of those things that if, if you're a theologian, I mean, you know this view is out there and it's and you know where to where to situate it. So some I could imagine somebody hearing it and say, well, why don't you just be Eastern Orthodox then? You know, that that's probably where it would go. Another question. Yeah. So piggybacking on... on this and last week's episode where we're talking about origin of the soul with creationism and traditionism and, and the pre-existence of the soul. Uh, what are your thoughts on a, a fourth path would be the divisible soul? Adam was given the soul by God. Eve inherited her portion from Adam's rib because she, she didn't receive the breath of God. She was just formed out of Adam's rib. And then through the fall of Adam... We've all received our fallen original sin portion of the divisible soul. I don't See, know if I, that would reconcile. Yeah, I, I would. I would say I don't think Romans. I think Romans five twelve actually contradicts that. Okay. And the other problem I have is I don't. I don't see. I'm not a trichotomist. I think you know, the Old Testament is immaterial and material. You know, division. And I and I take the. I take the. You know, the breath of life. Uh, that passage is giving God credit for why we're alive, you know, that sort of thing. I don't think it's like a special, you know, sort of breath, you know, planted into someone. I think it's a, it's a metaphor for God being the source of life and specifically our life. And I, I'll admit too, it's, it's connected to imaging as well, you know, because of, of our status, um, you know, that, that it's probably, there's probably part of that that makes it important to maybe connect that divine activity with the human being as opposed to something else. To me, the big obstacle there is Romans 5.12. Well, I think there's a bigger one than that. Right, uh, let's hear it. Is 1 Corinthians 15 in the resurrection body. Well, you just want to talk about 1 Corinthians no, 15. No, I mean, he literally <laughs> says the soma tzikikon, the, yeah. bo the soulish body, mm -hmm. or a body that's demarcated by soul or is... It's encompassed a, by soul or whatever. I you, don't know you, how you you'd animate wouldn't talk be about enough. It. Wouldn't, wouldn't Maybe. be enough. Okay. Yeah. No. That might, that might be. Well, they're both animate. So that's. So, but he has it in contrasts to soma psychic or soma pneumaticon. Mm -hmm. So the 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 soulish body versus the pneumatic body or the spirit body. So whatever we translate as soul, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. in Paul, which is I, uh, it's just yeah. it's, it's not he, there. He, he's he's saying in that, that sense. Yeah, he's but, saying the celestial body. The, yeah, it's the, like the celestial the versus body. the terrestrial one's yeah. just gone. Yeah, it's just anything it's that would be translated other, as yeah. sikon, which we translate as soul. Yeah, in the Bible is gone. It's not there anymore. Yeah, that's that's certainly an obstacle. So I'm like, yeah. with the only thing you have to translate in Paul that means soul, he says is just gone and done away with completely. Mm-hmm. So whatever that means for Paul doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so um, it doesn't mean there's not continuity between like form. It means that the substance is completely different. So uh, yeah, that's very problematic for the idea of soul uh, as some sort of yeah. you know, carryover type thing. Another question. Piggyback on that a little bit, but more on a practical like application stance. But I guess I would just have ask you guys to talk more about it problem that I have with original sin is kind of two things with the idea that God would create us in a way, kind of why we sin. So I know that we all have sin, but why we sin, that God would create us in a way that would force us to sin, and then yet we're accountable for it. Um, I guess I'm presupposing that God is just, and I don't find that just. So if you could explain how it is just, and I'm wrong, I'm glad to... I don't see God as forcing us to sin. now. What I, what I do see is God creating beings that are like him, but they are still lesser. In other words, we're not perfect and we don't have God's you know, impeccable, perfect nature. We are reflections of him. We are not him. So by definition, that, that does create the potential for failure, you know, for inconsistent, inconsistent choice when it comes to obedience and stuff like that. You know, we, we could give in to you know, our own you know, an impulse we have and not be able to thwart it, you know, that sort of thing. But I, I can see that kind of thing surfacing in a being that's less than God. But that doesn't mean God's, you know, standing behind going, come on, you know, it's time you sin now. Let's get get the show on the road here. He's not making it happen, but he's creating us in such a way, such a way certainly that the preconditions for it happening are going to be there. But the only way to avoid that is to pardon, the, you know, the the... the sort of you know, kind of dumb analogy, but the only way to avoid that would be to clone himself. Okay. You know, it, it, and that's just not what's going on with human creation. So I don't look at it as God, you know, creating beings and then forcing them to violate what he's saying, but, but the conditions are just there inherently because we're not him. That's how I approach that sort of thing. My cop out answer would be, cause I don't <laughs> think there is a solution to the problem of evil. Um, the odyssey is impossible. The only solution we have is faith in the resurrection. And that's not a solution. Mm-hmm. It's just faith. You believe. Uh, but the cop-out version of that would be James says pretty clearly that God never tempts with evil. So uh, the temptation to evil, I think, is at the root of your question, I think. And I think James just shuts that off from the from the root. Like, no, God never tempts mm-hmm. with evil. That's why you have a tempter. So it's the power is other. So which does cause a sort of um, it's, problem it, in it, sovereignty. It, it issues. resides in the flesh, though, too. Right. You, know, you, you got that issue. Right. But but if you deal with the whole like, I don't. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there because I don't want to get you, in trouble because a lot of people listen to this but, podcast. But, but look at look at look at who the look at who the tempter is. Trying to get the, a job in the future. Man. The tempter is a being also created as an imager, the same creator. You got the plural language of imaging going on in Genesis one, you know, sharing the same you know set of attributes. But nevertheless, you you could say again with with you know Psalm eight and Hebrews, you know that that humans are lesser. Okay, we're lesser, but that being is still not God. Okay, that being is still not God. And so yeah, you you have the same again circumstances where this being can act in self interest, you know, wanting autonomy, wanting you know to be released from the authority of God or whatever. You know, however we would sort of think about or, or imagine, you know, the, the motives. And then that being in turn goes to the human and starts to manipulate. So that, so the, you have the temptation from the outside. But even that is still in some way attached to lesserness. And for the human, you know, you have this external force. James, you know, certainly says that, but he adds, you know, the, the whole, you know, progression of sin, you know, involving the flesh. And you know, Paul says the same thing, too. So there are things that are working against us. There are things that are working against us. And, and look, look, why is Christ able 
to withstand temptations and, and the weaknesses, the, you know, like we discussed on the podcast before. Well, it's because he does share that, that nature. He is, you know, God incarnate. So that's, that's, that's the thing that separates him from us. And again, all, all that's, you know, super important because of everything that extends from the incarnation. But we're, again, I still don't view that as God um, forcing, you know, sin. But again, how would he prevent, other than like removing free will or cloning himself, how would he prevent that possibility? And that's, where, that's the inscrutable point, you know, because you, then you have to ask the question, well, why would God bother to do any of this anyway? You know, you, you fall back to this, you know, like the theological kinds of answers that God just loves to create. God, you know, wanted to do this or that or the other thing. So that, that to me is, is the more inscrutable point. But it's a, it's a positive point because what it tells us is that God would rather have made us than not. And that's kind of an important thought. So even though we can't nail everything down, we, we're, we're left with a thought like that, which is a good thought and an important one. I was just going to ask if it was if it would be helpful to try to reconcile some of that struggle with thinking about that we inherit Adam's pre-fall nature. In other words, Adam didn't inherit any quote fallen nature, and yet he still disobeyed and sinned. That free will was there. So it's like an analogy or a template. Yeah, it's correct. So like yeah. we still have that. We we always think about what we inherit is a post-fall nature. Mm-hmm. But Adam, not having that post-fall nature, was created, quote, perfect, never sinning, and yet he still had a nature that predisposed him to be able to sin. Mm -hmm. So if we inherit that, then you can see an inherent goodness that God creates us all with, and it kind of reconciles God's justness with his love and and all of those things. So think of, I don't know if it's helpful to think about it that way. No, I I think... I think there's things in there that are certainly worth, you know, thinking about. There are trajectories there that would probably be helpful. Question over here. Um, I'm about a third of the way through Unseen Realm, and a practical way that your ministry has impacted me was just a better understanding of evil, because I grew up with under Calvinistic teaching, so I read the Bible through that lens, and I, I don't even know how not to... And I was never told God causes evil and God does this, but I very much grew up under the teaching that He's always in control and He pre, pre, pre you know, He foreordains everything, He predetermines everything. And as a child, maybe not knowing how to work that out, I just maybe came to subconscious conclusions that God, when evil happens, God. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to say that out loud, but <laughs> that God's behind that too, right? Or, right. You know, but reading. A more, you know, the way you describe Satan's fall and what he did and how he was able to tempt Eve and then Adam, and then Adam was tempted. That's really helped me to see evil for what it is and how how it began. And God, in His love, mm-hmm. creating us with free will means yeah, He won't control us. Right. I mean, evil is no less real, you know, outside of the orbit of Calvinism. <laughs> I mean, it, it it is what it is, but. Again, I, I, you know, struggled with the same sorts of things because that is the the logical conclusion in a really sort of, I'll use a nice word, in a, in a consistent Calvinist system. Right. That those are the thoughts you have to think. I mean, you're 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 just ultimately driven there, and and yeah, you know, we we can all point to some Calvinist theologian that somehow you know tries to get out of that conundrum, but it's really hard to do. <laughs> and kind of kind of be honest with the whole you know, scheme of things. I think we all have these Calvinistic phases. Phase. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did, and, but it, it troubled me. You know, it really troubled me. Crying at John Piper's sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. Oh, I did when I was a kid, man. I came to Bible college thinking I'm like going to make everybody Calvinist at Bible college. And after a year of like deconstruction in New Testament you survey with down. Daniel Street you got beaten down. just ripped my mind out of my head and stomped on it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, I don't know what to believe anymore. <laughs> so that was, that was fun. Did you want to add anything? Um, well, but thank you, by the way. Oh, you're, well, no, thank you for writing the book. But yeah, also just there, Satan is the cause of evil. We're, we're the cause of evil. We, we don't make the right choices. We do sin. We do cause harm to each other. But some of it is just so severe. Like for pe- everyone suffers in their own way, but there are the people who really suffer. They've been, they really go through a lot. They've been raped. They've been beaten. They've been whatever. Mm-hmm. And understanding God is not, that's not God's will. That's not God's desire. 
but it it happens and he is watching it and it must grieve him i i know that it must but mm -hmm. to kind of reconcile i think i've been able to also see through your book that through us being the image bearers we're to alleviate what suffering we can and we're to be mm -hmm. we're to do all we can that's part of our job mm -hmm. but also the reality is that there's still evil and suffering and and god does see yeah. it and watch it and how will that be i know it will be redeemed but it's hard to watch it and it's hard to see it when it's yeah and i think that's why why david said what really makes sense of it is the resurrection you know i didn't say it makes sense of it. well you know what i mean just re i can't re i can't think of your exact word yeah i said it was my only hope yeah yeah the, the, i may not have well, used that you, word you, you but, said like yeah, yeah the answer to the odyssey yeah. is, is well i said there is no answer to the odyssey in my but that's view. where it leads but I, to, we may disagree i don't know no no i, but, I think it's a good it's yeah. a good statement um you know you have this world's not our home yeah. God, you know, has a people. Things will go full circle back to Eden. You know, what again, sovereignty doesn't have to necessarily be front loaded. It can, you know, work in the end and it and God is still sovereign. You know, even though he wouldn't be, you know, that's not the way John Calvin or somebody else would talk about it. It doesn't make God any less sovereign to have things end up the way he wants them to end. You know, again, because you know, out the outflowing, outworking of his plan. So I, I do think that's an important element. We really need to recapture the lament psalms in church, big time. I mean, almost a third of our psalms are all lament that don't end happy. They're like, everything sucks. Why do you hate us, God? Psalm over. <laughs> <laughs> and people, you know, you turn on the TV, you don't hear none of that crap. I think, I think Joel Osteen preached yeah. one. Yeah, everything's great, guys. <laughs> you know? No, it's not. My mom just died. Like, you know, no, it's not great. You know, uh, no, but put a smile on your face. Like, no, you know, I thought death was the enemy. I thought we mourn with those who mourn, right? Not rejoice with those who mourn. Like the we mourn with the those apostles were always mourn. happy, though. Don't, don't oh, yeah, they were real happy. <laughs> Paul's mm, they cheery were all, guy. Paul was on top of the world. Reglations. Their life He's was really an endless string guy. of victories. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. but I'm serious. Like the Lament Psalms is, they're liturgical in ancient Israel. They're liturgical in the church. This is still in the church's liturgy. I mean, if you go to liturgical churches, if not, you know, try it. I don't know. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Okay. Uh, so, but seriously, the Lament Psalms are there for a reason. I mean, and there's so many for a reason because that expression of just not having an answer mm -hmm. and reading every theology book there is on it and still being, I'm just going to say it, just pissed and throwing them across the room is a righteous expression of fidelity to God. Questioning God is actually something he welcomes. One of the most cut me to the core moments I had was with Rick Watts. You know, okay, Rick yeah. Watts, you remember? He's a, he was a scholar from Cambridge, taught at Regent for years. I think I think he's doing something else now. But um, he he wrote a book on Isaiah's New Exodus and Mark, it just blew my mind. Um, and uh, but he was talking about the the story in Exodus of the striking of the rock, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's this trial scene where you know you, you talk you've talked about this. Yeah, you, you, God welcomes the elders to question him and invoke his presence over the rock and strike it, strike it. And yet what comes from the rock? It's, it's water that brings life when he's struck. And you have this sort of image in John in the crucifixion. This is, this is when, when, when you have the incarnation, the God, look, we look up and see him. The one who's raised up is the one who saves in John. And, and they strike him and what flows out of him blood and water. And it's this echo that God is allowing himself to be put on trial. He's letting you question it, you know? He's letting you question him, you know? And it's this filthy sort of questioning. It's not even a righteous one, but he lets it happen. And it tells us something about the nature of God, you know, that it teaches us something about it, like about him, that the lament tradition I'm attaching this to the limit tradition because I think that's a righteous form of questioning. It's okay to cry and scream and yell and, and where are you? And you know, those are actually righteous expressions of faith. And the, I don't know why there's so many books written against that because there's tons of scripture that's like, yeah, embrace that. 
And there will be times in your Christian life, if you're honest, you'll wake up in the morning saying, is there even a God, you know? And that's okay. I know that sounds crazy for, for some people, but that's okay. That's what a real relationship is like. Mm-hmm. Anyone in a real relationship says amen, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it goes what, back to the, the assumes a relationship, questioning, right? Questioning and unbelief you know? are two different things. Right. You know, we, we, we tend, unfortunately, to conflate those things, but they're, they're two different things. Help my unbelief. Yeah. You know, again, that there's, there's a person who wants to stay in the faith. I mean, as you guys are talking, I mean, the first thought that kind of came up my mind was um, there was the I was in a conversation. I think it was earlier. It was actually on our Facebook group, and I think it was somewhere in the context in my head is like, so, so when I'm hearing you talking about like, you know, why can't why don't we question? Why don't we scream? Um, a song I've heard from this old band was simply called "Something to Say," and the the, the whole entire feeling and the emotion of that song was basically. I'm afraid to question because I'm afraid one, I'll lose my faith, but also because I'm afraid that I'm going to be all alone, that no one in the church, not even God, mm-hmm. will come and help me. And, and a part of me is, I, I guess maybe this is not an answer to me, it's just kind of reflection. Mm-hmm. This is just with our Western Christianity, we have become so individualistic that when the hard times and questions come, we fear that if we were to voice those questions, we would be completely alone and isolated. Yeah, and if, if you feel that, that, that's a demonstration of how unlike a family the church can be. Because if, if it's your own family, you know, you, somebody just goes off like that, your, your first response isn't going to be, well, I guess they just jump ship. <laughs> and then you don't really you don't really deal with that person anymore. No, of course not. Because they're your brother, your sister, mom, dad, whatever. You're going to try again to, you know, help that person. You're going to try to understand, you know, what's going on and basically be a, a son or a, you know, a brother or a sister, you know, to that person. That's, that's what, a, what would happen in a, in a normal and even, even a, a fairly dysfunctional, you know, family unit. But it's like in, in a lot of churches, it's even like more dysfunctional than dysfunctional. And and the the analogy, you know, I, I agree. I think that's really telling. One one of one of my theology profs in undergrad would would always say, or he, he taught psychology actually. He he uh, he would always say, "Don't give him a prescription." You know? <laughs> a prescription. Like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> well, here, brother, just meditate on you know John one or whatever you know, whatever. It is. Yeah, prescription. That's, that's don't don't good. don't give him a prescription. It's not going to do anything. And, you know, it, it, we, we need to recapture on top of lament. Yeah, it's pretty good. I, I mean, I liked it. It stuck with me. Or you stole it. Um, so. you, yeah, yeah, I stole it. Obviously. I'll steal it now. Go so. ahead. Um, he needs to copyright that thing. Um, but the, the, the idea of a lament and presence is, is, is inseparable. What you said really struck me because I've experienced this in ministry and growing up in the, in the sort of Southern evangelicalism. Um, uh, I, I experienced that same thing. It's like the kids with the questions were always sort of the ones ostracized out of the sort of the the church posse, you know? Um, and so in those who were like struggled with things that the ministers didn't have any training or answers for, they just had to leave and go somewhere else, you know, that could maybe find them answers to something. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, ethicists and stuff that have talked about this, that Sometimes you don't have to bathe problems in words, you know, there's not like theology or scriptures you can bathe things in and make them better. You just sit with them in the dark and be there like uh, that Job, you know, the best friends are the ones that shut up and don't try to fix the problem and just sit there with you in the muck, you know, and that's the whole idea of presence. This is why the incarnation is so powerful is the idea is. He literally comes in and just suffers with us. It's, it's, it's an embodiment of the suffering. It's not saying, I'm going to pull you out of it and everything will be fine. It's no, I'm going to come and soak myself in it with you. So that Hebrews, you know, nothing that you have been tempted with have I not been tempted with, you know. So, uh, so it's, it's that, that saturation and presence, the fact that you have someone there while you're in the dark is the thing that's powerful. And they don't leave you, no matter how deep the questioning gets. They're still there. 
And that's the part that's missing in the church, I think. You know, um, if, if and you it's guys, directly connected to that, what I mean by recovering lament. Yeah. You know? If you guys have listened to the any of the Fern and Audrey episodes, that's a large part of what they actually do, you know, with, with survivors. It's not and, – and when you listen to the latest one um, – we spent Trey and I spent you know several days with, with Fern and Audrey last week, and and one of the sort of the nice little you know quip statements that came out of that was uh, it, deliverance ministry goes looking for a fight, you know they're, they're, it's, it's confrontational. What they do is completely other than that. They they do what he just described. They they go through the pain and the the events of the pain and all this sort of stuff with survivors. That is a great deal about what they do. And it's so simple and so unspectacular, <laughs> but it's, it's so effective you know, in, in, in helping the people that, that wind up on their doorstep. They, they just do a lot of that. And again, without getting too much into their own story, they were unable, uh, I, th I think it might change a little bit because of the podcast, but they have been unable to have a church participate in what they do because people just get frightened at the kind of people they they're working with and they're I mean they're basically just alone but they're they're trying to have these people not be alone so again this is what David said is is a lot of actually what they do it's not terribly spectacular and they're not doing again what you think of as traditional deliverance ministry looking for a fight you know with some demonic you know first of all that's that's not really the problem that's very unusual uh, with people, the, the problem is actually worse. It'd be easier if it was just a demon, okay? <laughs> but but it's someone who's been traumatized by evil, over and over again. That's just worse. You know, give us a light case here. You know, let's just get rid of the. You know, um, they can they that that's why they say that's really rare. Most of the time, what they're doing is just helping people through human evil that has afflicted them repeatedly, and that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. It takes a long time, so it's it's quite different. But it, again, it's to me. I, I hear you know what David's saying. That's the example that I'm I'm sort of closest to because I I see what they do and we spend time with them and you know some of the the people they work with. All right. Well, we just want to thank everybody for coming out. Thank y'all very much. We want to thank David Burnett for joining us, and we want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.